Hello everyone, it's Donnell McAdams. Um, I'm here, Westerly educated, or Westerly accredited teacher and uh, SoBiz promoted instructor. And we're here today to finish up this holiday stocking from the Quilt As You Go. So for those of you that have been watching along, you know that the first time we actually quilted um, the back of the stocking and last week we quilted the front of the stocking and um, this week we're going to finish it up and so I've got my pieces all ready and um, want to remind you that you can get this as uh, June Taylor it's a June Taylor uh, printout so it prints out onto the um, uh, quilt batting so that all you have to do is follow the numbers and put that on there so um, those are available so I do have a handout. I'll put it up after class today because later in the t today I'm going to show you how to make a star and I just called it star making. It's just a one page handout. And so I'll talk about the handout so you can reference it, but I'll put it up afterwards so that you can get it. It will be on the Westerly by Me page, and it will be on my website. I will try to get it up on the So Steady page, but that's not always the fastest way to get it. So we're gonna go ahead and get started now with the construction of the stockings. So you'll notice I have my uh, foot on for a quarter inch seam. The very first week we made our little tie, or I shouldn't say tie, but our loop that is gonna go on our stocking so we can hang it on the mantle or wherever we're going to make that. If you weren't here with us then, what we used is the bias tape maker, and obviously ours was not bias, it was a straight edge, but it's the Clover number 25. The package actually looks like this, and um, it's really one of those things, it's so easy to do, you can go back and reference the first video so that you can see how that's done but you'll notice that i've also stitched right close to each of those edges this piece is six inches long and the thing that you need to watch on this is when we put this together and we're preparing to put it onto our stocking we've got to get it at an angle that works so i'm going to pull this down here and show you what i'm talking about so here's my stocking, the toe is down this direction, and I'm pulling it this way, and I want this to be about a quarter of an inch down because I want it so that it catches, it, it doesn't catch in this top seam, but it catches in the side. So when I put this straight in here, when that gets stitched, it's gonna go straight out like that. If you want yours to go at an angle, such as out like this, so that it's going up, you gotta pay attention to how you put it in here. So if I had this right here like this, and I get a straight pin so that I mimic what it's gonna be like, I just actually go ahead and put that in there as if that were the seam. Look what happens. This goes down. So you have to work the opposite of what you think it's going to be. So this one would need to go like this. So you're gonna to need to put it in here, thinking about it coming up this direction and going that direction for making the stocking. And so I'm going to put this in here at an angle and pin it in place and again test it. Now you want your pin to be like your seam would be so that when you turn this over, it's gonna go up at an angle like that. And that's what I want to do. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna leave that right in there. I wanna make sure that it's gonna catch. So I'm gonna take this pin out, make sure my ends are sticking out into the seam a little bit. And I'm just gonna take the pin and go like that to hold it in place. And then I'm gonna pull it down here and put another pin because I don't want it to get caught in that seam up there. So now what we're going to do is I'm going to show you an easy way, if you're doing a stocking without a cuff, to make this so it's so simple to put together. 
So what you wanna do is you wanna make sure that your stocking pieces that are quilted, this is my piece that I quilted, that when you put them together like this, they're not gonna get stitched like that because we're gonna make it so there's a lining in there, that the toes meet up. So you're looking at wrong sides out, right sides in when it's together. And I'm just gonna take that and lay it aside. And now I have two lining pieces that are the same way. So I'm gonna take it and I'm gonna put it and I'll just move it so that you can see it. But what I'm gonna be doing is I'm gonna be stitching a lining to each of those quilted pieces right along the top here. So this is gonna get stitched together. And what I wanna do is I wanna put this on top like this, even though I'm only stitching that one end, and I'm gonna slide this down here so that you can see it matches up so it makes sense like this. And it's not gonna get stitched down here, just across the top. So now what I wanna do is I wanna make sure that it's not pulling in, like that is right there just a bit. I need to release a stitch. I think I remember that happening when we did that that first day. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna put this together, knowing that I've got enough space there, and I'm going to make sure I'm not anywhere near a pin, and I've just got this set for a standard straight stitch, and I always want to, again, this is the home ec teacher coming out, I always wanna make sure my thread is underneath my foot. I'm just doing a regular straight stitch a quarter of an inch away from my edge of my fabric there. So it's just a quarter inch seam. When I get to the end, I do want to back stitch. It's almost hard to go back to doing something like that after you've been doing um, template quilting. I'm gonna go ahead and cut that. And now you'll see that when I pull this back, that is stitched together like, this, like so. Now what I'm gonna do is I am going to press this so that the seam goes towards the lining. So I'm gonna be pressing that towards the lining. So I'm gonna lay this over here to the side and I'm gonna repeat that on my backing piece. So as you can see here, I've lined this up so that the toes are together, right sides together, and I'm just repeating what I just did. Now when I actually do this stocking, I'm to sew it together, I'm gonna sew a little larger than that quarter of an inch seam. But for right now, I'm doing a quarter of an inch. So I'm gonna set this so that those are right together. If you feel more comfortable pinning them, you go right ahead and pin, that's not a problem. As I said, I am using my quarter of an inch foot here. You notice I just kind of do this scratch method and that's to pull it back so it's even. It works for me. If you wanted to backstitch down there, you certainly could. And now I'm going to backstitch here and cut that off. And just like I did on the other one, I am going to press my seam towards my lining. So you can see here, my sewing fairy pressed my seam for me. And so I've got that all stitched like that. I can release this pin because now it's not gonna matter where it's at, nothing's gonna happen right there. And so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna turn this this way and I am going to lay my stocking that is quilted on top, the backing on top of the top, or the front I should say, and I'm gonna lay the lining on top of the lining. 
So to make it easier for you to see, I want to get this seam right there lined up with the seam in the same spot on the other one. Now in some cases, we're so used to quilting, we would have put those seams going the opposite way. But on something like this, that's not what we want to do. So I've got my two seams, they're lined up so that when I stitch them, they're gonna come out in the same place. Now, the trick of this is we've got to turn our stocking and the easiest way to turn our stocking would be to leave open about a three to four inch opening. And that's what I'm gonna do right here. So from this pen to the pen I'm putting in right now, we're gonna leave that open, but I got a little trick for you. So when we come back around there, it'll make it really easy. Now I'm gonna take just a second and put a few pins in around and you'll notice I'm putting them in so that they're perpendicular to the edge I'm going to stitch. And I can tell you stockings can be forever project or this way is so much easier to put these together so that when you're finished you don't even have to do any hand stitching. So you'll notice I came right here and I'm lining up those two seams. If you have any questions, go ahead and ask them. I just know that a lot of times as quilters, you may not be coming from the construction side and as far as having done sewing garment construction. And so it helps to have these tips. Now, because this is quilted, I really don't have to put quite as many pins in it because it's solid enough, so to speak. It's not flimsy at all that you're not gonna have any issues with that. Again, I'm gonna scratch this back here a little bit because I want that to be even. And if you remember the first time we showed this two weeks ago, we actually drew a pattern off of the piece that was on the quilt batting because you wanna have a pattern so that then you can cut this out later and in case anything shifted, your lining pieces will all be the right so size. So Sandy has a question. Why both seams to the lining? Because you'll see when we top stitch here in a little bit why it's gonna look better that way. Now what I'm gonna do is, I'm gonna get this foot out. If you have a guide foot like this, it really, it doesn't necessarily have to have a guide on the edge, but it does make it pretty easy to go around there. Um, actually, that's not the one I was thinking of. But it will work, so let me just get, nope, I'm gonna use this one. If yours has a guide, you can use that. Some of them have a guide inside. I'm gonna use the clear foot. I want to use what I would call a 3 8 inch seam. And the reason I say that is I want it to be bigger so that it's not right on that quarter of an inch where we've already stitched on some of the pieces that we've already finished. So you'll see when I get this in here, this one just picks up the foot, so I'm just gonna set it down and just turn it till it picks it up. There we go. And now we'll thread that needle again. Oh, I love needle threaders. And so now, Remember I said I'm leaving this space open. So I'm gonna come down past that and I'm gonna start right here. And I want to go about 3 eighths from the edge. So I need to move my needle a little bit to the right cause I'm a little farther in than I intend to be. So there's about 3 eighths. 
Most of your feet might even be three eighths in the center. And so I'm just using the edge of my foot now. So I'm gonna forward stitch. I'm going to back stitch. Notice I took that pen out because I don't want to hit it. And now I'm going to be going all the way around. When I come to the heel there, you will notice that this kind of acts like it's going to pucker. Now this is more for you beginner sewers that haven't done some of this. All I need to do, watch what happens when I raise my foot. And now when I sit it back down, everything's cool, ready to go again. And if you have a pivot feature on your machine, which I do, but a lot of people don't, so I wanted to show you, if you leave that needle down and just pick that foot up, you'll be good to go. And we're gonna go all the way around. Do not sew over those pens. Because my needle's down, I'm not, you know, getting a jerky stitch or anything. It's just a matter of lifting that up. And like I said, this machine does have that pivot feature, but some don't. So I just wanted to show you, you may actually be lifting that by hand, reach into the back back here. I have a button that does that. If you don't have good, sharp quilting pens, straight pens, I would encourage you to get those too because it makes a huge difference when you're putting something together, not having to fight that pen that's not very sharp. If you're in the market for a new sewing machine or something, some of the things you need to look for is definitely a machine with a needle up, needle down feature. It's like a third hand and it's also nice when you're doing your template work too. Now when we come to this thickness right here, what I want to do is I want to sew a little bit farther and then I'm actually going to lift this up so I can get all of this underneath there. And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to move on and go over that. Again, coming around these curves, you won't even notice it as much because this fabric, as I said before, being a little bit more firm because it has the batting on it, makes it so it's really easy to just swing right around those curves. Do we have any questions? Uh, no questions so far. Go ahead and send them in though if you've got any. Now we're almost back up to the top. We've got that bump there that's gonna be from our hook or hanger for our stocking, so we want to be aware of that. Notice the pins inside here. That's okay, because I'm going to still be able to get it out later. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to hold it in place and go really slow over that so I don't actually hit it. And then when I get to this, that's my seam. I'm taking that out, and this is where I'm going to backstitch. Now, here's my little secret. You're gonna cut this, so my threads are cut. I'm gonna put it back in at the same place and put my foot down, and I'm going to lengthen my stitch to a basting stitch. I'm going up to about four, and then I'm gonna stitch this with a basting stitch. And the reason that I'm gonna do that is the next step is I am going to press this back. So I'm gonna get my wool mat and move it right up here so that you can see what's going on. 
So go ahead and set that up there, and if you can move that down just a smidge. And also, would you um, explain a little bit again of what pieces you have for those that are joining us late? Well, this is my, go ahead and, are you in, okay? Yep. Okay. So what I'm gonna do here is these are my lining pieces. They don't have any batting in them. This is my back that we did the first week. This is my front that we did last week. And I've stitched all the way around. And this right here is where I have basted. So what I'm gonna do between those, first of all, I'm just gonna take this and I'm going to make it so that I press it so it's open. So I'm just pressing this seam open. This is just a sewing tip here. And then I'm gonna flip it this way and press it so that it's back on the seam. Because after I pull those basting threads out, I'm gonna reach in and turn it, and then I'm gonna come back and I'm gonna stitch it shut. So now those seams know where they're supposed to go. So we'll just set that over there a minute. And I am going to now come back and I'm gonna take that thread in there and I'm just gonna pull out the basting thread. Now, had I left that tail longer, I could have probably just ripped it to begin with, or pulled it to begin with, but I didn't leave it long. And so now I've got that thread right out of there, so I've got my opening. So at this point, first thing, reach in and pull out that straight pin that was holding the hanger in place. And I'm gonna come down here and I'm going to, and some of you are thinking, I wonder why she doesn't clip that. Well, it's a stocking and because of the way the direction is on that, you really don't need to. It's gonna round around just fine. The other one would be the one you would need to, but it's a lining, it's inside. No one's ever gonna see it. So now what I'm doing is I'm just kind of pulling this up like you would a, a stocking that you were gonna put on and then flipping this inside out. So now that I've flipped that inside out, the first thing that I'm gonna do is come back over here and you can see how this is already turned in. Everything is fine that way. This is just a thread that I'm gonna trim off. It's one of my basting threads. And I'm just gonna set this down put my needle in place. I always like to stitch a couple stitches forward first. Your machine likes that. I gotta go back to my regular stitch length. My needle's gonna move, so I need to go back to that. There we go. And so now that I've stitched forward, I'm gonna go ahead and stitch back. And I'm going to get the rest of this in place. First, I want to kind of pull out my stocking. So you can see I've got that pulled out. And now that I've got this and that was already pressed, I'm just going to stitch right along that edge and back stitch. And then we'll cut that thread. And I'm gonna get my little snips that get real close to the edge there. Snip that, that, I think that's a hair there. I guess it's one little thread back here. Well, there we go, got it. Okay, so now our opening is closed. We've got our stocking turned out, and it's just a matter of pulling out the stocking. And because it's quilted, it's not hard to do. You can see that it's just coming right out. It's gonna lay nice for you.
And before I put the other part down in there, I want to press this. So I'm gonna pull this back over. And honestly, I would probably get to my ironing board and press it there because it is a little bit bigger, but this is convenient for you to see. I'm gonna pull this out. This is what makes something go from good to great is taking the time to do what we call roll those seams. Everybody's quiet out there. Well, you've got such great instructions on how to oh. put this together. Well, it is pretty easy. I am excited in a little here in just a few minutes when we get this finished. I'm going to show you how to make stars because it kind of goes along with Christmas. And I'll tell you, there's so many things out there that a good star can be the medallion type in the center and whatever. So I wanted to show you that. I had some questions this week that came in, just general things, and maybe the people are out there that asked them, but I'm going to go ahead and tell all of you. I had someone come back, and they had used Frixon markers, and they had done as I suggested, but little white lines came back. So I said, well, spray it with some water or some more Best Press or Starch Savvy and press it again. And all it needed was just a little bit more liquid. So that way you can do it without laundering it because we know it all comes out when it's laundered. So if, you're ha if you have that issue, just spray a little bit more on. Now you will have first needed to spray that on there. I ask you to spray two layers on before you even mark. And you don't need, that's why I love the fine line. You don't need to have a thick, heavy line. The fine line are perfect so you don't have that. And don't go over them two or three times, just one time so you can see it. Now, I do things a lot heavier for show here because I want you to be able to see it at home. And would they, Linda would like to know what iron you're using. I'm using a steam fast, and I love this little guy, and I got its big brother this week. You can go over there and get that box, Megan, right over there, and I'll show them because I used it, and I love it too. This is mine. I used somebody else's before at a, at a show. And so this is, the, this is the Steam Fast Travel, and I've been using it and absolutely love it. And then this is the new Bigger Brother. Just got it out of the box here and it will hold more water. It also has on the bottom, so if you were to travel overseas, you can change the voltage on it. And it has these little things on the side, so when you want to steam, you just press it like that, and it steams. You have a steam or a no oh. steam, oh, I'm sorry. You have a steam or a no steam option, and you can see your dial here as to how you set your iron. So that one's great, this one's great. The unfortunate part is I can't really help you make a decision because they're only like $5 difference in price. So either one is good. All right, now we've got our stocking this way. It's all stitched together. The opening is stitched closed. We press this towards the lining. So now it's time to turn that and push the stocking part down in. Now you're thinking, why in the world did she spend all that time ironing that lining? Well, you don't have to. I just kind of like the look of it. And now what we're going to do is... It's the teacher in her. It's the teacher. That's right. What we're going to do is we're going to take this... I've got a long one there. And we're going to press right around that edge there. So I'm going to press from the inside to the outside... So that way I can see... Oh, we're not in the screen. Let me move it down. There you guys go. So that way I can see that I roll this so that the outside is on the inside. I hope that makes sense to you when you roll it. It's rolled just a little bit more to the inside. So I'm going to turn that that way. Remember, I already pressed that lining. 
the, the seam to the lining so it almost is already convinced where it needs to be. We do have a question. Um, does the fault, regular faultless starch work in place of starch savvy? I'm just gonna have to say you try it and if it works, the answer is yes because I've not tried it. I really don't know. The reason I don't use that is because those tend to leave stuff on your irons and your ironing boards, like a flaky stuff. So you can see how I've, whoo, that iron is hot, hot, hot. Yeah, but tell us, they, they like your little blue mat. Can you tell us about okay, that? Okay, this is a silicone mat. They come in a bunch of different colors. There's purple, there's green. Um, they also come in a rectangle that says iron while the, press while the iron's hot or something like that, a bunch of fun ones. So all it does is allow me to leave it onto my um, wool mat. You can see it's even on top of this. This isn't hot because all of the heat is being held in by that silicone mat. So I can leave this here all day long and not have any issues. Now I'm finished with that, so I'm gonna set it. I have it on a little TV tray over here on the side. And you can see my stocking here is already finished. You wouldn't have to top stitch around the edge. I just like the look of it better when I do that. So what I'm gonna do is, I am gonna put this foot on that has that edge on it now. I always forget, these feet snap on. So now I can leave that piece on there, snap this off. And now I'm gonna move that over. Let's see here. There you can see my needle moving over. Some of you may have a mirror image button even that allows that to move. And so what I'm gonna do is I am going to turn this back and I wanna start, since my thread is red, this again is just another little sewing hint. Since my thread is red, I'm not gonna start in that gold section where when I come back and do my back stitching, it's gonna show up. I could even start clear on the back. But you can see how the toe of my stocking just kinda of jumped straight up. It was laying down and it turned itself up. So you wanna have it good and pressed and then go ahead and you can see how I'm guiding right along that edge, always stopping with my needle down. You can see how this is turned more to the inside. I love it. Donna Jo just posted that she, she is going to do one of these with her grandson. Oh, that'd be great. Now, when I get to this piece here, if by some reason it's like in the way, I'm not gonna let it be in the way. I'm just gonna move my top stitching up a little bit, or I could totally stop and start on the other side. But now when I leave my needle in, I can pull this out of the way and back, put my foot back down and just continue right along there. And I just think the top stitching gives it a real finished look. Patricia says we need to have a snap-on ruler foot. <laughs> it might just snap off while we're stitching and that wouldn't be good. I don't know. Okay, so we're all the way around. I'm using the cutter, but I'm going back in and I'm just trimming out this thread. I have one on the front from where I began. And so, ladies and gentlemen, mission accomplished. We didn't have to do any handwork. The stocking's all finished. We've got our hanger on and in place, ready to, to hang it up. And if you wanna get me the other one there, Megan, we got a pair. So 
there they are, ready to go. And you can use on this, remember they had eight fabrics, I just used four. They don't have to be exactly alike. You can see how this is, they, they're not exactly in the same position. If you have an embroidery machine, you could come back and put an initial on them if you wanted to. Well, obviously you would do that before you put them together. But I just love doing the quilt as you go. It's fun, it's pretty when it's finished, and I hope you enjoy doing that project. So any questions on this before I go into stargazing? All right, I'm gonna change to my ruler foot since it doesn't snap on. And set my machine for ruler work. Nancy's gonna make one of these stockings for each of her grandkids. They're a lot of fun. And you know, the thing is, I don't think they all have to, unless it's, you know, it depends on you, but I think it would be great to, you know, pick their favorite colors. Maybe you got a granddaughter that went, likes pink and purple, make it in those colors. So they don't have to be all reflections of Christmas. They can be a reflection of the person they're for. All righty. Susan wants to know what machine you're working on. I am working on a Janome. M7 Continental. It has a nice big large opening. If I move my hands down you can see it's big and um, the thing I like about it the most is all of this open space right in where you can see right here. All of that is open. So this is what the handout will look like when you get it. I may take some of the stuff off of here and just make this picture larger so you can see it because I know let me put it up here. I know you can see that there, but I wanna make sure that you can actually see it on this handout. So I might make that just a little bit larger. But what we're gonna be doing is on this star, we are going to do some use with the um, outer rim tool. I couldn't think of the name. And I believe it's laying right over there because I was playing with it while I was drawing. And we are going to use the six point crosshair square for this. Now you could have eight pointed stars also, but, but so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna come in here and this is gonna seem like a backwards way of showing it, but we're gonna move over just a smidge here and I am going to put my thumbtack in first. And the reason I'm doing this is because I am going to be not only drawing with that six point crosshair grid, but I'm also going to be using the outer rim tool with the thumbtack. So if I do it all with the thumbtack in there, it's gonna make it easier. So let me see if I've allowed myself enough space to do what I want to do. Oh my goodness, no, I want a little more. I'm gonna show you how this would fill in like an 18 inch square. So I'm in the middle here. I'm gonna take my eight point, or six point, excuse me. I'm gonna set it straight up and down. So I'm gonna turn this so you can see it so that that's straight up and down. And I'm gonna take my chalk marker and I'm gonna draw all six of these lines. Now, if you've never used one of these before, you know, you may not understand all the lines that are on it. So if I had it this way, so the words were right up here at the top, which there you can see them, and I drew my lines, they would be on there like so. And so now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna be rotating. Let's see, I had it on there this way. Yeah, so I have that on there this way. I'm gonna line up this line now with what I've already drawn. And so when I line that up, I'm gonna make these like dotted just so they're enough different. 
Now, if I was using Frixon markers, I would just make them a different color. Which is what you did on your handout. You have the different right. colors, I just correct. did them different colors on the handout. But I need 12 lines to do what I'm going to do. And so I am going to get my straight edge. This is, this is a straight edge that will work here. Actually, I don't even need that center. I've got my center right there. So you will notice on the handout when you get it, and what I'm showing you right here, on the blue line, which is straight up and down in the picture, which is my solid line, I am going to do lines at 2 inches and at 8 inches. Let that sink in, 2 and 8 on the solid lines. Now what that means is it's a 2-inch circle, and an eight inch circle. And a two inch circle is only one inch from the center. So what I'm gonna do is, this is what's called the outer rim tool. And I am going to be using the flat end. Now if you've been with me before, I love my ruler stickers. And I put the green ruler sticker pointed to the flat end. And the reason I'm telling you this is because if you're in my classes and we talk about the green sticker, you'll be on the same end. So this is basically a compass that makes our life so much easier when we're using something like this. So what I'm gonna do is, because I need a two inch circle, I'm following the numbers on the green side. There's my two. Okay, so flat edge, green arrow, number two. So all I do is I put that on to that pen, line up that line, and I'm just going to, on all of the solid lines on mine, I am going to make a mark. Solid lines, solid lines, I have to keep telling myself. Solid lines, uh-oh, it moved off, it will happen. What did I do? Megan, I need that point of that iron. This is the beauty of this stuff. Get rid of those lines. I'm one that's willing to admit my mistakes but I'm also glad I left my iron warm so I can iron them out. Okay. Look, it's a magic marker. A magic marker. Okay. Or magic, er magic erase. Racer. That's what I was thinking I was of. Say, I don't know what you're talking about. So two inch on solid lines. and don't let it come out of place. Now, the picture that you have or will have, I actually did this on paper using colored pencils. So now that was a two inch on solid lines, which is blue on your design, and we want eight inch. So on those same lines, I'm finding the number eight, putting that on, to that pen and marking all the way around. So now I have a line at two and a line at eight. Now on the dashed lines, or in the picture, they are the red lines, I need them on four and a half and 15. So green side, four and a half. So I'm taking the half between four and five. And some of you were with me, oh, I don't know, a couple weeks ago when I did something like this. And it kind of scared them to begin with. Because it Maybe was a lot of planning. A lot of planning, a lot of marking, but it ends up oh so neat. And I think you'll like that this one too. 
So now the next one is at 15 inches. So I'm coming up to 15. Now you could leave this one off. This is just simply a design that can grow. Now you can notice I don't have, where on there do I put that? Well, that's why on your picture, you're gonna have one that looks a little bit funny because that's what I end up doing. Uh-oh, get the iron, Megan. I'm supposed to be on the dash lines. There we go. Dash lines. Which we have a question from Peggy. She wants to know what kind of marker you're using. This is a chalk marker by Clover. I empty out this chalk that comes with it and I replace it with pounce iron off chalk. Yep, Patricia caught us. Yep, we need to be on the dotted lines. Thank you yeah. guys for watching. <laughs> being attentive. Take care of us. You'll notice how I found the center of that. Yeah, we got a couple people who said they remember your Bethlehem star from a while yep. back. This is going to look totally different, but obviously done the same way. So now we have this all marked. We have two lines on each of the solid lines and two lines on each of the dashed lines. So now what we're going to do is we are going to take our straight edge and you can use whatever you want, but I got to get mine out here. I keep it all in the same bag and I am going to use my 12 inch arc tool. I will not use it for all of them because the lines get a little bit longer. So I'll use my little ruler for that. I have what's called a centering ruler. That's my design. And I put template tape on it and I actually use it not only to measure, but also to stitch. So now while I was talking there, I pulled out that thumbtack. And what I'm going to be doing is picking my starting spot. I've set my machine up. Um, I think you'll be able to see this with the red thread. And what I'm going to be doing is, this is my center here. So I am going to, one of the lowest ones there, I'm going to set my foot down. You mean your starting point? What did I say? You said center. Yeah, starting. Okay. Needle down, needle up, foot up, and if you floss underneath there, you can usually get a hold of that and pull those out. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to set my needle back down in that spot, and I come to the next one on the next line. So that's this one right here, and I need to be able to space it so my needle hits right there. So I'm going to use my spacing gauge. Remember, yours are clear, mine so that you can see it, and I need to set it up. And one thing I need to make sure you understand is when you're looking at a spacing gauge like this, we use them vertical like that. And this is the width that's equal to a quarter of an inch. This is equal to an inch. But the narrower side needs to be flat against your ruler. So if I was over on this side, I wouldn't have it like that. I have it flat against the ruler. So you can see as it goes around that curve, it changes directions or angles. And I want you to understand how that works. Okay, I want to look at my finished star over here for just a second. Because I don't want to start off wrong. Okay. You never want to get rid of your first project so you because you want to know how to do it again. So I'm going to stitch to this. I'm going to stop and I'm going to turn this and I'm going to come back down into this right here. Measuring again. I'm stitching out to this. 
stopping there, rotating, measure to get right back to that point. Now, if you were inside a quilt or something, you could do this without turning. There's no question. I can take this and do that. But it makes it a bit difficult for you guys to see what I'm doing if I don't turn it to the angle where you can see. So that's what I'm doing when I turn this. Are you ready for a question that's not quite on topic? I don't care, that's fine. Okay, Susan wants to know, where are some instructions on how to clean the templates once they get dirty? I did a um, video on that once. I don't know if it's still out there, but um, if your templates get dirty, I use um, TriFlow oil to clean mine or a product that um, I have available that's called Get Off. And it just takes that any of that sticky right off. We'll have to see if we can pin that onto the website that we have. Because yeah, that sometimes you do need to clean these and it just takes it right off because whenever I go to do a show, I'll clean all my templates, but by the time the show's over, they'll start looking kind of ratty again. Okay, I'm gonna show this once today because some of you may not have seen it. I need to go one more stitch. And that is how to secure. Now I know some of the educators secure by going back over their stitching and that's perfectly fine if that's what you want to do. I like to go ahead and bury my threads. I also had a comment this week that said something about that they don't like side threading needles because it gets caught in the batting. Quite honestly, I've never had that happen. Um, I do use the cinch side threading needles and what I've done here, I think I'm still in screen, is I'm gonna take this right straight back down where it came up. And so all of those threads, you can see at the star is completed, but all of those threads are on the back. So I'm gonna flip it over so you can see it. So all of my threads are here. This is a little bit different than I used to do it. I take two threads in one, two in each hand, and tie them in a knot. And then I pull them back in that side threading needle and I simply pull them, or to put the point in and bury them between the batting and that backing layer. I pull it down about an inch and pull that through. Unfortunately, I lost a couple there. I guess not as many as I thought. So if you do, you just get it again. I just like to have my threads buried rather than just cutting them off. So now once that's in there, I give my threads a little bit of a tug so that they bury when I put it back so it's flat. So you can see that I have buried the tails of my threads and this is what the package looks like. This is the cinch side threading needles. Okay, so we have got the inside star finished. So now what we're gonna be doing is we are going to go to one of the points of the star we've already finished, and we are going to start again. So I'm gonna take my needle down, my needle up, raise my foot, pull out my threads, foot back down, and get it right back in place. And so this time, we're gonna be coming out to this spot. So I'm going to now come there. I'm going back in to the top of that star. And we're just gonna find our way right around this using a point from before and a new point.
And so you can see the advantage. Now you may just design as you stitch. I like to do it on um, my paper first. That way, if I think, oh, it's a little squatty, maybe I need it like a half inch more. And that's why the 15 inch was on this. And you can stop before it gets to the 15 if you want. But it, I, I only went out 13 and it just looked really, really squatty. So that's why I went to the 15. And of course, all the different things that you've been seeing, how you can do cross hatching or you know, designing or whatever, you could pick, pick some of these spots and do something else inside them. So like this would be great for template quilting as well? Oh yeah, you could do that too. Now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna show you what some of the other educators do and that's fine and that is they just kind of walk down their row a little bit and then just cut that off. And so the tails on the back, you would then go back and cut those off. Sometimes it shows up a lot, dark or you know, an, an obvious spot there. On this one, it really didn't. But you can see what we're developing here. A star and a star. And we're always going to the farthest point out, put down my foot, or excuse me, my needle and my foot, raise that needle, oops, I did it twice. And now we'll see, there it is, get that thread out foot back down and we're going to come out and you can see this nice big space here that you could do echo quilting in, you could do free motion quilting in, you could choose some of the mini templates, so the mini, the designs that are the minis. There's just not enough time in the day to do all that I would love to do with quilting. But you can see why if this was like two, well, it would only be one inch shorter on each side instead of um, two inches. But you can see why I thought another inch making that circle go from 13 to 15 made sense. And this is all done just by, and you could do this with a five point. I did this with a six, but you could do it with a five. But it's just by plotting points. And that's why it's so much faster. I can remember before I understood what the outer rim tool did and how to use that. It would just take me all so much time measuring out every single line on a ruler, whereas you can just put it on that point or on the pen and just turn it around. So it's so much easier. So here we are back at square one, so to speak, or should I say star one. And I'll do the same thing that I just did here, and that is to go over some stitching and just cut it. So I'm coming in with these little scissors and cutting that out. And now what I wanna do is hand this to Megan and let her press that off so you can see what that's gonna look like. Got any questions? Yeah, Nanine says, do you make this like Chris, like a Christmas star? We have a flower that they call the Christmas star when it's Christmas over in Sweden. This could be. I mean, it's not like any specific um, star, but it was just a star that I wanted to show you how you can create. So that should be good enough to get the idea so that I can show them. Do you have another question? Yeah, Patricia's got one. Would you do, I think what she's asking is, would you do your, um, all the burying of threads in one, at one time at the end, or do you do it as you go along? Quite honestly, I like to do it as I go along because I just want them out of the way. So you could do it all at once, but it's just easier to get them all out of the way, and it's not that hard to do as you're doing them. 
So bear with me just a second and I'll have all these lines off so you can see what this is gonna look like. And Peggy made the observation, it seems like the sewing isn't taking much longer than the marking. Which... Right, exactly, excellent observation there. So there's the finished star. I got a couple white lines I didn't take time to finish off with. But you can see here, this was the straight line right through here because the, the inside was the one that was at two and four and a half. And then on the other line was where we went to, I believe it was four and a half. Four, oh, excuse me, it was two and eight. And those are circle sizes. Those are circle sizes, okay? So this is only one inch from the center and four inches from the center. And then this is the other one. Now you could keep building this, obviously. You can see how you could keep building this out if you need to or want to. But now it would be fun to come back in and do either some echoing in here or like I said, some of the other um, things that you could do. So Melanie asks, would parabolic curves fit in the star points? The bigger ones, I think they would. Definitely, great question, good way to do it. Yeah, I definitely think they would. Yep, and of course you could do this with, um, you, could, you could do multiple things. You could bring, come back and you could bring points here and points here, like start from the center and go to the point, from the point to the center, and then you could cut out different things with, with uh, the template quilting. And then you could also do echo quilting. I don't know if you said that with your, your echo guides right. to make it bigger. Right. So now I wanna show you something else that I have done with that same template. And I know some of you were around for this before, but I wanna show you this again. This is a staple here, so I'm taking my finger and, sh and putting it over that so you don't see it. But this is something that I did with the bottom of a spin and echo number four. So you can make stars, you can see it right there. You can make stars with spin and echo number four and it's done similar to this. But I liked this one better and I thought some of you may not have this template, wanna do something like that and you could do it. But I wanna show you how I made a fun border. I don't know whether you wanna see it like that or you wanna see it you know, up and down. But the reason this is here and I need to move it is, I have figured out when I use the different lines on here, how tall and how wide this is gonna be. So let's say that I have a three inch border. I want something to fit in a three inch border. So I'm gonna take my ruler here and I'm going to create a three inch opening. So I'm gonna take this and just make myself a three inch opening. This is just for reference here so that I can, and you can see why I like my long ruler so that I can get those edges. So let's say that that's our border. That's three inches. And I look at my chart here and the height is what I want to do. Well, I probably don't want it to be exactly three inches. I probably want it to be a little bit smaller. So I'm gonna take the, the nine on my little template, and this is nothing that was intended for this. I know Leonie didn't intend this, so this is just something I took the time to figure out. And if I put this line right here, number nine, on one of my lines, I will have a two and a half inch tall by three and three quarters inch wide design. So with that being said, I'm gonna turn this upside down. We're gonna come over here so that you can see. I'm not using a pen or anything because I'm not doing this star with this. I'm doing something totally different. And so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna set that right on that nine line. I'm gonna come over here to the side, put my needle down, bring my needle up, my foot up, and I'm gonna floss underneath there to get my thread. 
and I'm gonna pull them out to this side. So I'm gonna go around that end of the template, back to the line. When I get back to the line, got one more stitch. I'm simply gonna come over to this side, line my nine back up. I'm gonna come over here And if you wanted to mix it up, you could do every other one a different size. I mean, you're, you're the one in control of your templates. Now you're gonna notice that I can't get all the way over here onto this. I'm just gonna go down to the bottom there. And when I go off the edge, I'm gonna stop. All right, so I'm just gonna cut this. Now to come back, what I'm gonna do, I mean, that's okay, but that's not very interesting. I'm going to take my nine again, only this time the line that's going vertical here is gonna be on that dip or valley. Now I'm just gonna start, cause I know it's held in place. I should pull up my end, but I'm not going to. Wouldn't do that like that on a project. I'm gonna stop here, come over. Now, you'll notice, and this will happen to you, you'll notice that that is off just a little bit. Can they see that on there? That's off just a little bit. So all I need to do is sew to the top here. It's kind of like when we do scallops, and just move it back in place so that it's lined up. Nobody's gonna know. Whoa, oh, wrong line, that helps. Whew, scared me. Whoa. Now I'm gonna show you something just because this is kind of when it, you would use it, but not really. Let's say for example, you were you needed to come right to that edge and you made, needed to make it so that it worked. This is something that I think I would, needed a couple weeks ago and I didn't have one, it took me a while to find it. This is my little piece that's like three inches by 18 that allows me then to put what I need to put right on there so these are not out on my outer edge so I can still get accuracy with what I'm doing. So Linda wants to know, can you give them a cheat sheet of those numbers that you figured out for this design so they don't have to figure out all that math themselves? I will give it to you. I'll put it on today's handout. Since I haven't put it up yet, I'll go ahead and do that. But you can see what this border would look like. And it's kind of a neat border. This is a half inch here. If I wanted to fill this in, Remember, that was three inches. Maybe I want this to go clear over there, and if I do, on my little cheat sheet here, if I would set that on eight, it would have gone clear over there, and the reason you need to know this number is because if you've got a border that's like 36 inches long, you know to divide it by four to know where you want to start if you need to find a center and that kind of thing. So it just helps you to know if you're centering, if you're trying to get things to work out exactly even where to put them. So that was all with what's called the Spin and Echo 4. If you bought the winter collection from last winter, this is one of the templates that's in that collection. This particular Spin and Echo is in that collection. That was the winter collection from last year. So we have any questions? Jay wants to know what would it look like if you use the opposite side of the fabric? So I don't know if they're looking at the backing. I've asked that question. Get back to us so we can see what you're... Asking. I don't know for sure what you mean, the opposite side of the fabric. In other words, go one time this way and then the other time this way. That would be interesting too. I'm sure you could do something like that. 
Yeah, just play with it. Get your stitching line out, disc out and play with them on paper. You know, figure out what you want to do that way, what works, what you like. Just because a template is designed to be using this doesn't mean you can't use this. I mean, I could use this too if I wanted to. And if I wanted to do this and use this end right down here, I would put a piece of my tape right across that end. So I'm not sure where my, there it is. It's already out. So I'm doing something that I haven't tried before. So bear with me. I think I, that is what they, what, what they were asking. This is. right here? No, I think they were trying on the other side. You use all of one line. I think they're saying what would go, to, if you the go other, to the other side. Yep, that'd be interesting too. But on this, you could actually put this on here like so. Am I out of the space? Yeah, okay. There you, go. you could put this on here like this. And then you could make, you know, the humps that are a little bit closer. So since you asked about the other, We'll give it a try. We got edge down here on this end. We can make a three inch and figure out what we're doing. So let's go ahead and draw that. We won't have a big one, but we'll have it. So there we go. So we've got three inch wide there. We won't have much at all, will we? So we're taking it, so we're going to go this way. Now this is where I obviously need something back here at the back, so I'm putting that down. I'm gonna start right here off the edge. Got a little out of sorts there, I'm trying to keep it all on. So let's go ahead and cut that, admitting my mistakes. So now what we'll do is let's go this way. So we're going to put this down here on nine. Well, it's different, but it's not so much that I couldn't like it. So you can see what you come up with. This is a little off here. This should be a little closer because I got out a little ways from it, but that's what you would come up with that, or you could actually have these so they came right through the middle of this. So they came down so the humps were across from each other rather than this being centered. So yeah, you could certainly do that. So any other questions or comments? Martha just really likes your first one that you did, that it was just a, made a really sharp border. Yeah. She said that she'd never thought about using a template for another purpose. Right, it makes it, it makes it fun to look at a template and see, you know, okay, what can I do with that? What are the different things? For example, the one I was doing right here, I want to, let me see if I can get this so I, I have to have something to give me a straightness factor. So if I did this one here and use this line like this. I agree with Jackie. She says that would be a great template design for a border. Yep. That would be really cool. Oh, there was a question that Susan asked earlier and I missed it. Thanks for asking it again, Susan. She said um, she doesn't have a six point crosshair. So could you do a star with an eight point? You can do an eight point star. It gives a total different look. Um, I will tell you that crosshair rulers are definitely worth their weight in gold to extend the usage out of your templates. For example, when I taught this class before, these are some of the templates that are in the winter collection set. 
this looks totally different using a six point than it would with an eight point. The same with this. This really looks like a poinsettia. This is one of the templates in that set. It really looks like a poinsettia, and it's because I have 12 going around there rather than eight or the next would be 16. So you, you're, you really get more looks. Now, I have the minis. Obviously, that's what I used here. You wanna hand me the minis there on the front of my front. This is the back, that's the front there. These are what the minis look like, and they come as a set. You get the five, six, and eight all in one set. So if you wanted to, to extend your templates with not complete investment, you could get the minis because you can always use these. You'll notice everything crosses in the center, but you could draw this and then extend the lines longer with one of your rulers. So, but I, I honestly have, I have all of them in three different sizes because I use them that much. And they will really, like I said, if you haven't invested in the book that's called Designing with Crosshair Rulers, that's a great book to get too because it teaches you how you can do a lot more designing just simply by using a crosshair ruler in a way you may not have thought about. So you can see how I'm doing this and getting that particular design going there. And of course you could come back and cross over with that. So I hope you've enjoyed this today, getting a little bit more um, from some of your templates. This template can be purchased by itself, but like I said, you can also um, get it with that winter collection from last winter. And this is that star that we did. The white spots are that we just still need to press out a little bit more because it was under the thread. But I can see so many opportunities here for embellishment um, that would just really make this pop is the best way to say it. So you mentioned that book. Bell wants to know where can they find that? Is that on the website? That would be on, um, yeah, So Steady has it. Contact your local quilting store. Um, or give us a shout and we'll get you fixed up with one. But it's called Designing with Crosshair Rulers, I think is the actual name of it. It's a great book. It's one that teaches you how you can take like, you know, a square that's maybe 18 inches and divide it up into six inch blocks to create a design that's all one, but it's the way you place your templates um, and place your crosshair rulers. So yeah, really good book. Always more things coming. Um, I can tell you that, you know, you can live with your sampler set one forever. There's so many things you can do with it. But once you branch out and start getting some more of the templates, um, you can really, you know, expand your uses. I'll share one more thing. If you were on Westerly by me, I shared it this week. But this was a class that I taught back in April. And this is one where the whole idea was to teach people how to stitch over seams. And so this was a mystery quilt project. They didn't know what it was gonna be when they started. It's not a mystery now to you. We may offer the class again, but what this is, is all of this, these are only four and a half inch squares here. So there's a lot of seams in that. But the whole idea was to teach how to piece with 50, excuse me, with 60 and 80 weight thread so that your seams are all flat so you don't have to worry about your templates going over them. This is done here with the um, Spinifex 4 from the sampler set and a six point crosshair grid so that there's six of those going around. So again, it looks more like the poinsettias that are in the background there. So that is a fun table runner that we did. And you can see around the edge, I've used the um, scallop or the clamshell template, the small one and then the large one to finish that off and quilt that border. So I guess it's truly Christmas in July for me right now, finishing up some things and uh, um, getting ready for some, some new ideas, some new classes, some things for the fall. I just got this pretty piece of fall fabric. I can't wait to get started on a project with that. I mean, that's really, I mean, just to me, it looks like somebody just went out and photographed a pile of leaves. It's just so pretty. So um, 
I hope you have gotten something from this. This has been a project that's taken us three weeks to do, but um, I'm not sure what we're going to go to next week, but join me again at 2 o'clock Pacific time, 5 o'clock Eastern time, and we will have some fun projects. As soon as I know what it is, I'll get it out there for you. And remember, the handout for today will be coming shortly. It'll definitely be on the Westerly site and on my um, website, which is SoBizMarion.com, and then I'll try to get it up on the so Study site. So if there aren't any other questions, thank you, thank you. Um, always enjoy having you in my quilting studio. So bye for now.